Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have five INTJs and I'll let these INTJs introduce themselves. So Chris, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? <laughs> uh, yep, hey, I'm Chris. I run the channel Asura Psych. I am a psychology major with a bachelor's degree in psychology and I'm seeking to become a clinical psychologist in the future. I am an INTJ and I test as a five wing four in Enneagram, but I'm not too experienced in Enneagram. Cool, cool. Chris is a certified MBTI practitioner like myself too. Um, Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Jasper, would you like to give us a little bit about it yourself? <laughs> sure. My name is Jasper Davis, and I am the director of music and technology for a church in rural Maryland. My background is in business, specifically working with nonprofits, and my future aspirations are in the legal field. So I'm preparing for law school and looking into a PhD in economics. My Enneagram type is five, wing four, social subtype. Fascinating. And Michael, how about yourself? Would you like to give us a brief intro? <laughs> yeah, Michael, also a INTJ, five wing four social subtype. So I think Jasper and I will probably be finishing one another's sentences during this. And uh, I don't know. Um, my favorite movie is um, Knights of Gabiria by Federico Fellini. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> Michael and Jasper call each other twins. Awesome. So, Lindsay, would you like to give us a few words about yourself? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Lindsay, um, my YouTube channel is Lijo, so you might see me there. Um, and I am a co-founder of Snug, um, Snug.me. It's a technology startup. And uh, my background is in um, creative production and um, various parts of technology, so. Very, very cool. <laughs> and SnugMe is like a YouTuber type of organization too. So if you're a YouTuber, go check that out. It's a, it's a cool website. <laughs> and then Melissa, <laughs> would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am the mom of four children. Um, I am a professional pianist and a dance teacher. Uh, I work for Personality Hacker as a profiler and um, as like a profiling coach specialist type person. Uh, at Enneagram, I think I'm a five. I think that's about it. Magnificent. <laughs> so three, uh, uh, four of us here are from Personality Hackers um, program, um, Jasper, Michael, me, and Melissa. But Melissa is like our our teacher, professor, I, I don't know, like our, pro, our personality profiler um, coach. <laughs> I like um, professor better. I haven't been called that before, so if you can change it to that, that'd make me really happy. <laughs> Very much so. My first question for you guys is, what are some INTJ stereotypes that you relate to? And what are some INTJ stereotypes that you don't agree with? Anyone want to take it first? <laughs> I mean, we can plan. I I, uh, I agree with that one. I think unhealthy INTJs can be really vengeful and unforgiving. So if that comes up, then I'd say, yes, you're referring to a very unhealthy version of our type. Um, false, would, I would say like that we're robots. Um, I actually saw it. I'll, I'll turn it over after this, but I saw a video uh, someone had posted a couple of weeks ago and it was, it was uh, the caption was ENFP meets INTJ. And it was this little girl going up to this thing on the street that looked like a robot. And she's just like, hi, robot. I love you, robot. Hi, And it's just like a stand of it. So that one, that's the one that's completely false. I think Joyce knows I have a lot of chaotic energy and I'm, I'm just a goofball. So I don't understand um, that one. Yeah, yeah, I would I would say um, the biggest stereotype, and it goes along with that, is that a lot of people, especially in the typology community, tend to think of INTJs as just like introverted ENTJs, almost as thinking dominant types. And they forget that intuition is a perceiving function that is far more relaxed than people will give credit for. Yeah, I would follow that too with saying that, you know, that INTJs are innately very cold 
humans, like we come off as very um, sterile. And I don't think that's really the case. I mean, I think we're far more conscious of um, the integrations of things happening around us and how we should interact with them based on what's going on. And so I think, you know, if you're actually tuning into you know where the vibe is where you're trying to go in a conversation or whatever it is we can actually like not be cold we can actually be relatable you know sometimes our the way we communicate can be a little bit um more short but um that's just the lack of fe so yeah <laughs> how about uh jasper and melissa what are your thoughts on being called a robot uh, it's not it's not accurate at all um but I would say, I would say it's almost like in a, in a way there's a part of it that's a compliment is the wrong word, but definitely I don't want to be seen as, as, um, as emotional as I am. So, um, there's a good reason that it, if, I mean, I would way rather have somebody say that I was a little bit cold, but like in control for sure. than say, man, she's a basket case. She's all over the place. We can't even listen to her because she's so emotional so like that part of myself that is emotional I kind of do feel a little apologetic about like in a public situation or in a situation where people are trying to make a decision uh it would be rare for me to just say I don't know I just don't want to just because I don't feel like it you know it's I feel like I have to show up with good reasons and with some dignity and uh I mean I think I think there there are things that we do that lead to us being seen as cold but definitely what's inside is not cold at all. It's very alive. I think from my perspective, the, the coldness is more a, a side effect of being so committed to this radical authenticity where I don't want to express anything that doesn't feel like it's in alignment with what's going on. And so rather show nothing and then figure that out and then determine if it's worth showing than be presenting something that feels like it's out of alignment. Oh, that's a good way to say it. Yeah. That is so very like accurate. I, I felt like I was inside the mind of an INTJ when you said that. So that was like really cool. <laughs> so what are some fictional and real life examples of INTJs that you guys relate to? Well, I can start, I guess. I, I just did a video on this like two weeks ago. Um, so there's one fictional INTJ from a like a cartoon that I think is a good representation of like the growing INTJ. And that would be Raven from the show Teen Titans, which if you're in like the 20, your 20s now, you probably know who that is. But she comes off as like this private and mysterious person. She's not overly aggressive with her thoughts. She's not focused on the logical outcome. She's trying to follow her own path and figure out her own journey. And that was something I always related to growing up was that character. I think one that um, I, I think is a really uh, so accurate a portrayal of our type that it's creepy is uh, Al Pacino as Michael in The Godfather. I think, I, I'm not sure how he embodied that character, but like down to the, down to micro expressions, I think he's, I, I think he did a spectacular job of playing um, an INTJ in, in that movie. And, uh, and the classic is um, Crime and Punishment, Russ Kalnikoff, which if anybody hasn't read who's an INTJ, I mean, there are long, long passages in there where you would think that he was just nailing down our functions for just pages and pages at a time. Also, also a little creepy. Fascinating. So um, someone who I relate to who's uh, a real life um, person is, uh, and actually he's, he, he's an author, but he's also on YouTube. Um, I'm sure he's been integrated other places as well, but is James Clear, um, who's an INTJ and he, um, his content is all about habit building. And I remember when um, we were typing him, immediately I started watching his videos. I was just like, this is exactly my language. Like I knew immediately within the first five minutes, I'm like, this is another INTJ. Um, just because the way that he approaches material is so much like he will um, define the concept and then he'll be able to articulate how to apply the concept to you know, people's different situations, right? So he's not lining out specifics line by line, like this is how you do this, this is how you do that. But he's saying like, this is the this is the mindset you need to apply to a situation like this, and now you can use it in any type of situation like this. And um, uh, he's just like a really inspirational speaker and in how he just 
he translates ideas in my own language, so it's easy to understand, but he's able to communicate to so many people of so many different types very well. So I think um, I, I relate to him a lot, but I aspire to be more like that too. So really cool. I'd never heard of him. <laughs> no. It's, I'll look them up. It's it's really cool to see all these examples of INTJs. I'm totally going to search it up later. And yeah, Raven's very INTJ. She has that reserved thinkery type of feel to her. Um, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, Melissa, do you have any examples of INTJs you relate to? Yeah, I've, I've always related so much to uh, Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. Um, feeling like he's just so... When you first meet him, yeah, like you see the cold side. And... He actually is kind of a snob um, in, in the ways that he is, like things he decides to make judgments about. Yeah. Um, but when you see him on his home turf, there's something so much more warm about him and so much more lovely. Like in the you know last half of the book, when you see him on in his own, in his own realm and his own element. And I've always, I've always related to that because a lot of uh, I think some of the coldness or some of the reserve or, you know, that that INTJ side for me, a lot of it is a. I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to use the word anxiety, but it's like an anxiousness to make sure that I'm not making a mistake, or an anxiousness to make sure that I'm not jumping in or making a decision that I shouldn't make, um, or I don't know, giving forth too much energy and then later on having to deal with the consequences of it from other people who now think I'm their best friend, or you know, there's lots of there's lots of reasons for it, but. Uh, but I think they're maybe a little bit uh, kinder than they can seem on the outside. And then I do think if you see an INTJ in their element, there's a lot, there's a lot more there. There's a lot of warmth and a lot, you'd be like, whoa, they do have social skills. <laughs> they do, you know, there, there is something attractive or warm about them. That's very true. <laughs> uh, how about Jasper? Um, do you have any fictional INTJs? Yeah, I'm, I've been hesitant in the past to, relate to the fictionalized INTJs because they do feel so much more in alignment with the stereotypes, which I feel personally that that doesn't resonate as, as thoroughly for me. Um, especially when nearly every INTJ is this, they have this malicious antagonist presence within whatever story they are. And I, I feel like I, with, I can really see where they're coming from and understand and like hold a lot of space for those feelings that that maybe led them on that path. But I, I feel like I've never seen a great representation of a benevolent focused INTJ. And perhaps I just need to expand my, my repertoire of what I've consumed. But the, the default narrative is INTJs only want evil and they don't care about others. That yeah. is so true. Yeah. They like at best tend to come off as neutral. Like. <laughs> I think it's an interesting one is if you look at like the silence of the lambs, I would, I would type both Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins in that movie a, uh, as INTJs. And it's, it's, if you look at that as an INTJ to INTJ relationship, also good versus evil, then you get both sides of that. I mean, it's hard with fiction. It depends on how good the writing is. And there's obviously, you know, I mean, what, what are you going to do? But um, that, that's an interesting one to look at just in terms of hero and villain, I think. This is like the most like TE efficient conversation I've had with any group of people ever. Like you guys just know the point and you say the point. I'm like, that's it. Wow. <laughs> Everybody watch this back to back with the EN five ENFP video that Joyce just posted. <laughs> that was chaos. <laughs> so any more thoughts on like fictional and real life INTJs? Your general thoughts on it too. Um, I think going back to the the evil, you know, the stereotype of, of us being evil, I think some of that is, I mean, I think that there's just a big difference between behind the scenes and evil. Like, I think there's a lot of people who are afraid of that, afraid of like being controlled behind the scenes, you know, that, that sort of stereotype. Um, but there are so many times, you know, I mean, I've been a teacher for years and there's so many times that I see potential in a student, for example. And I know that if I said to a certain student, hey, I want you to sing a solo in church next week, they'd be like, no way. But if I start preparing them, you know, months and months and months ahead of time and we start doing just little tiny things in their piano lessons that allow them to be more vocal. And then pretty soon I'm like, hey, let's sing this together. And I sing with them and I sound like kind of a dork. And I'm like, oh, well, 
and I make it seem like not such a big deal. Like I'm planting seeds in their mind all the time uh, that you can make a mistake and not be judged or that if you show your sincerity, like people will usually respond to that. Things like that, uh, that end up with some really shy kid up in front of church singing a solo and feeling really good about it and moving on in their lives and, and having more confidence. And so I think, yeah, it's still behind the scenes and the kid doesn't know I'm doing it as I'm doing it. It's really quiet and it takes a long time. And I think those things are associated with being like sneaky or evil or self-serving. But I think we can use those skills in very positive ways. And I think, you know, probably many of us do. It's just not that that's not what society sees as the as yeah. what we're going to use that skill for. And if you if you look at fiction, one thing that always stood out to me in contrast to the INTJ is that almost every, not almost every hero, but a huge majority of heroes in fiction are like ESFPs who just represent the complete opposite of that, where they just go and do the good thing without question, thought, or any like tact behind it. They, they're just getting right out there and interacting with <laughs> the, the Yeah, e absolutely. Well, the INTJ has more of a long-term type of plan with it or a long-term mm -hmm. vision to take yeah. things. Yeah, I think like, to both like what you both said is like we are often like we're so defined in what we're seeing towards the future and so whether that's positive or negative it's we see a clear picture of how to get there and so you know if someone is on a more negative mentality of where they want to go it's like they're driven to that point no matter what and so those are the the, the cases you're going to hear, right? Or the, that's where the storyline exists. That's interesting. But then all the other ones who are like they're driven to do something that's more you know beneficial to the world or whatever it is, there it's the same thing. It's like that we're so pinpointed and we're like, okay, here's the steps for me to get there, and we go and get there. But it's like it's not an interesting story in an SF way. So it's, mm -hmm. no one wants to talk about that one. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm wondering why like INTJs in fiction turn out to be like normally portrayed as like the evil mastermind. Like, are there like good INTJs in fiction portrayed now? Like, <laughs> I wonder why that's the case. <laughs> yes. Is it harder to, like, is it harder to spot a good INTJ because they're uh, far apart from the stereotype, so it's harder to type them? <laughs> I mean, I just think the great villains are always more memorable anyway. And like, it's, it's um, like we, <laughs> when it, I mean, if, we, if you're a malevolent INTJ, then you can get it done. You know what I mean? So it's a good villain to set up against like an INFP hero. So just in terms of archetypes, I think it, I think it does make sense. Um, I mean, it's kind of cool. I don't know. Like, I'll just I'll just throw that in there because I know that the the standard line from us is, "Oh, we hate so much. It's always sinister and la da 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 da." And I'm just like, you know, they're interesting characters. You know, I mean, I it's not you know morally, um, <laughs> you know, it's not more good moral guidance, but like they're always fascinating characters. Very much so. A any final thoughts on this topic? <laughs> no. Cool. Okay. So, what is everyone's relationship with control? So control in what sense? <laughs> it's up to you. Interpret it how you want. <laughs> with needing like control over like a creative project or with anything. I would say that I like to control when it involves things that I'm working on, but I'm not really interested in being in control of like other people, for example. Um, I'm more so interested in just having the ability to do whatever I need to do within the the thing that I'm doing, essentially, like if I'm working on a project, I want to be able to have final say and decision on almost the entirety of the project. It's the reason why I don't hire someone to do any like my thumbnails or editing for YouTube, even though people have offered to do that for me. It's like, no, I want complete creative control over that. Yeah, I've had like FI user friends of mine tell me that like some of them that they like full full creative control over their projects. And I wonder why that is. Do you guys have any? Like clues as to why that is? I would say for people with FI, um, I mean, a lot of it's their identity being attached, like their value and identity being attached to the project. So it's more like they're putting out a piece of themselves when they're being represented creatively. And so um, it's more personal in that regard. Um, as it's related to myself with like control, it's, um, 
control comes from the, like in my own projects, it's like, okay, I, I see the steps to go from, you know, A to Q or whatever it is. Um, and so that's never a question for me. And then it's just implementing it and getting it done and you know, doing whatever else I have to do to make it get there. But um, when it comes to like, um, like Chris, like you were saying, like when it's other people's projects and things like that, it's like, okay, I'll, if I'm maybe like in a side role or something like that, I'll say, okay, you know, it's your, you'll do your thing. I don't want to have to take on extra responsibility of control, but then when it comes to a place where it's like things are falling apart or like, you know, if, if it's falling apart and then it's like, okay, well now the responsibility, even though this wasn't mine, it's like, I'll feel the, the need to then take the situation and then mold it to where it can continue to go. And then it's like, I'd rather have my hands off unless it's mine personally. Um, and then again, the personal regard has to do with, not because it's like my identity that's being represented, but it's because I'm very sure of how to go along it. And I don't usually trust a lot of other people to know those steps the same way that I see them. So. Yeah, I agree Lisa? with that. Uh, yeah, and and I mean everything that people have said so far. Like I and I definitely think it can be frustrating. It can be frustrating with people working at least around me because they they feel like oh let's do this together or you know let's be part of a team. And there's just like I've got zero. There's zero team effort synergy within me. Like I just don't. I can, I can support someone else. So if it's not my project and if it's like, Hey, will you come in and give a little talk for my class? Or will you teach a dance at my folk dance party or something? Sure. I can come in and do something as long as I do it my way, but it's so hard to collaborate to like, let's all get together and come up with an idea and just kind of divide out the parts and divvy up what we're all going to do. That is so hard. Or at least for me, it's very, very hard to do that because there's a certain way I want it done. And the truth is, there's a lot of times when uh, there literally isn't time to get it done the way that I want in the timeline that it needs to get done. And so it comes back and bites me a bit because it's like there's a deadline. I have to have it done you know, by a certain time, but I want it my special way. And then it just hit the deadline and definitely, you know, at, maybe at the last minute, I'm scrambling around and... No, usually it still turns out okay, but there's just, I think that's one of the, one of the reasons maybe for the long famous INTJ timeline is some of that perfectionism or control or wanting it to really represent me. And uh, yeah, yeah, it can, it, it can be like, it can be great if you come, come out with a really good project pr product and you're like, yes, this is exactly how I wanted it to be. But then there's other times when I'm like, uh, maybe if I wasn't as controlling, maybe if I did let someone else just join in so that I had a little more like leeway, like to lighten the burden a little bit, I think it could turn out better sometimes. Yeah. And with, with creative projects, I think if, if you have a vision of what this needs to be, and particularly if it's a very complex project, and if you're working with dozens and dozens of people, then then I feel like we can we can try to maintain like an obsessive amount of control over you know details. I mean, I will get into like micromanaging positions in those cases because you're seeing. I mean, the timeline is is long and complex on a project like that, and you see how if you lose one thread, you see how it spins out and it it affects everything else. So it's like, you're trying to keep hold all these threads together. So you see, I feel like I keep talking about movies, but like you see, I mean, you know, filmmaking is one of the more complex things that you can do. So if you look at different types of filmmakers, you see a lot of uh, EPs out there and they just, I mean, just total chaos energy, improvisation, and um, really um, shooting from the hip. And then magically things get done, you know? It's like that Shakespeare and love quote where it's like, you know, how are we going to do this? Everything's falling apart. It's like, it's a mystery. I don't know, you know, but it doesn't work that way with us. So if you look at like, I would, I would call like Stanley Kubrick, David Fincher, Christopher Nolan, our INTJ filmmakers, I would say the Coen brothers, Jill Cohen, I would say at least is a, is an INTJ and it's very uh, uh, methodical and structured. And it's a, it's usually, it's typically a very calm environment on those projects too. It's not the kind of chaos energy that you hear about with like some other filmmakers. Everyone says it's a very, it's very calming. Everything is in order. And that's what you want is you want everything in order and you want to have a plan that you can follow and stick to the structure because if you lose it, 
your mind can spin out from seeing like the domino effect of anything that um, you lose control over. So it can be obsessive, but it also, if it's well structured, then it can be actually very like calming and, you know, calm environment that's conducive to creativity, I think. Yeah, interesting. Um, I wonder if like the TE, like it knows that other people intrinsically don't have as much TE as you. So it's like, oh, they're gonna do it, but they're gonna do it like kind of like half assly. So it's like, huh, I, I trust only myself to do it like full assed. So it's like, okay, <laughs> then I'm gonna do most of it, you know? So I, maybe it's that. But uh, Jasper, what are your thoughts on this topic? <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to zoom out from the control over creative product projects back to the general relationship to control with uh, stating that I don't, I don't feel this overwhelming desire to exercise control over others, but I, I feel a very strong protectionist sort of mentality about not letting others control me. And so doing what is necessary to ensure that I remain in control of myself. And that also means trying to like take full command of like my full physiological self, which is, is difficult and like some things feel automatic and it, it it feels frustrating that I can't like make my body sleep on command or I can't ignore certain sensations of hunger or you know that level of control is what I think I as an INTJ and probably some other INTJs have aspired to and it maybe there's an unhealthy level of aspiration in that because there's a, there's a certain humanity that we should probably embrace but that's what came to mind when you asked about control. That's fascinating. So I guess on the topic of controlling others versus controlling yourself, like what is your relationship with controlling yourself and what is your relationship with, I guess like controlling others, it's a kind of vague topic because it could also like deal with FE too, because FE is more about like controlling the social realm or the social equilibrium in some way and making sure everyone's feelings are up and that like making sure everyone's happy. And like, so I guess like FE is, exerts a lot of social order. And so that could be kind of interpreted as control. But um, I wonder what, like, what is the INTJ version of control for that? That makes sense. It's a hard one. <laughs> I'd say the only thing I want absolute control over personally is my temper. I never want to lose my temper. I always want to have absolute control over how I'm reacting in a situation, you know? Uh, and that, that requires like infinite patience too. But I think we can we can like we we have an ability to to hold space for things we really don't agree with, and not lose it. I think we I think I think health a healthy I would say personally like like a healthy INTJ should be like untriggerable to a certain extent because just because like we can and that's good energy to have in certain situations. Yeah, those are definitely traits that I've had referred to with me. It's like, I don't have a temper. My wife, you know, I've never even raised my voice at her. I just don't, I'm not emotionally responsive like that. I, yeah. I, I agree, too. Um, and, like, especially with the, yeah, I'm very even-keeled for temper. I think that's, I've had people literally say, you're very even-keeled. And when I was a child, um, or younger at least, people used to call me Switzerland because I was always very, like, I could see both sides of the story very easily. And um, I was not emotionally attached to really either one. I was like, well, that's what's going on over here. That's what's going on over there. Here I am, you know? Um, but as it relates to control, like, for myself, uh, I'm very, there, that's where it's more intense, I'd say, because though I'm not, imposing control necessarily on other people to be like you you know must do this and this whatever um even though that happens sometimes but for myself more it's i'm very controlling of my time so like to me like my time is like my, my most valuable resource it's like the most important thing to me it's like i have only so many minutes within the day and those minutes can either be spent towards things that are like progressing me as a human or they're you know Take, taking away from basically what I can build into. And so that's always been a part of me. So throughout the day, I'm always so conscious of where is my time being spent and is is that thing important to what I need to be doing? Um, and so that will trigger certain habits, which a lot of people say, well, that's a good positive habit. You know, you're very in control of, you know, where you're putting your time, but at the same time, it can also be imbalanced in a, a negative state because, you can become so obsessed with um, 
kind of like where you're putting this energy and um and then you will tend to not do so much on the um the extroverted sensing and introverted feeling side of like am i doing things i just like for enjoyment and it's like if i look at my time span throughout the days and the weeks a lot of times i'm not spending very much time in the enjoyment side i'm doing the you know um, the building side of what i'm trying to you know create or imagine and so um that's where i see the control really come from myself with that, it, it seems like, you know, it goes back to the long-term vision. So like INTJs are very hesitant to do things outside of the long-term vision and that it might feel like it's a waste of time sometimes for some INTJs. Back to the topic of control. So like OP, it talks about how IJs like control and in Personality Hacker, they have a similar turn. So what happens is like a fixation on control causes a certain type of invulnerability. Like you guys mentioned, like not wanting to get angry. I feel like that's not wanting your emotions to control you to do something that you'll like not want. So it's like this type of invulnerability that might be in that area. And so it made me think about like INTJ ones. Like if someone was an INTJ but identified more with one, would they be like more of the angry variation? Or all INTJs come like this? I don't know. But <laughs> so Jasper, what are your thoughts on this whole topic? Just your whole thoughts on control and like where this conversation is going. I would say that there, I, I can definitely relate to the piece about wanting to remain even keeled. And, and it, I wouldn't even say that's much of a, I mean, that is a conscious desire, but it's not something that I feel like I have, actually have to strive towards. That's sort of the default way that I react to things. And I've even experienced where people are so off put by that, sort of lack of response that they, they they ramp up their energy they're like they're trying to sometimes physically push it out of you and and get a response and you're just i'm getting more stable more grounded because that <laughs> it feels very safe and i'm like i'm growing in power as you are pushing me and so it's uh <laughs> it's actually filling me with a lot of excitement because of how how in control it feels to to be able to respond in that way and it definitely does tie into the invulnerability piece where I mentioned earlier the having control over our what I would call sort of the extroverted sensing side of ourselves or it's just like we want to control how we physically move through the world but then also controlling that introverted feeling side with how it's actually I would say it's what out of FI we end up leaking outside of ourselves and it does feel like a leak if something comes out and we didn't intend for that and that that can lead to so many, uh, I was going to say unforeseen, but a lot of things are foreseen for us. So a lot of th a lot of foreseen sort of side effects, if we let something get out that maybe wasn't part of our plan, it's hard to plan around feelings, which is, it's why I like to stay in control because it, it keeps a static, predictable sort of resource to work with. Whereas when you introduce this feelings component, it's, it's um, more difficult to manage that resource. And so I, you see that when it's applied to other people with their feelings in the mix. And I, I, <laughs> over time, I've tried to become more accommodating and understanding of, of people's unique individual needs and, and their, especially regarding their emotions and how they respond to things in the moment that they don't have as much capacity around dictating. But it, it requires so much more effort on my part to say, uh, well, here's the plan. We said we'd do this. And so if we do it, we're going to stay on track. And they're like, but I don't, I don't feel like doing that now. I'm like, okay, so how do we, how do we work around that? I mean, how do we accommodate that? I feel like one thing, I mean, maybe one of the greatest challenges of my life, uh, having four children and they're very close. I mean, they're each two years apart and they are they have a lot of special needs like autism and anxiety and different things like that. And so it's, uh, I've been, I mean, I'm in a position of control over them. Usually like in, in the, the outer world, I don't, I don't seek control over other people. And I, I, I need permission. Like usually I can see what needs to be done if I'm sitting like, I don't know, in a group situation and someone says, Hey, what should the person in charge do right now? Cause everyone's getting kind of out of control. I could whisper to my friend exactly what should happen, but I'm not going to get up and do it usually um, unless that's my job. And I definitely need someone to give me the job to do it. And then I, then I will do it, but it's not something that I'm just going to go take over. Um, but with my own family, like that's my job. 
And so uh, I guess I would say I do see a very uh, a natural ability now that I have the permission to um, be in control of my of my children. I mean, even with all their their needs and issues, it's and it's not a matter of I'm so excited. I've taught them to obey me. It's like I can't cope if they don't. So uh, I can take them in, into just about any situation, and they're extremely. You know, they can be running around acting all crazy and climbing on things. I could be like, kiddos, come over. And they're like, Vroom! and they come. And it's it's just a matter of like, as a parent, that is such a high priority for me to make sure that, because if I don't have control, if people are just running around screaming and yelling and silly and I say, come here, and they don't come or whatever, like that's stressful. That's so stressful to me that if I say, guys, it's bedtime, that they all go to bed because I need my quiet time after that, or that if I need to concentrate on something, I can say to them, you know, kiddos, it's time to be quiet. And that they'll just do it without a whole lot of, so I think I put a lot of energy into making sure that I, cause it's, it's really control over my environment. still. it's not that I think they'll be better people. If I can teach them to be in control and obey me, I'm not thinking in those terms. I'm thinking I need the, I need to have control over my environment and they're in it. So I need to make sure that there's certain things that are understood and that they're going to obey when it's time to. So I don't know. That's just an example for me. That's like come up of definitely this is a priority in my life that maybe I wouldn't have known was, I, you know, I wouldn't have known quite how much it was uh, if I hadn't been put in this circumstance, just something I direct a lot of energy toward. Yeah. And there's like a lot of TE in there too, because it's like giving clear standards to your children for them to like, I'll be on the same page about what like to happen on that. So very cool. My question for you guys is what is your relationship with leadership and how do you feel about it when you're given one? What are your thoughts? I very rarely opt for a leadership position. I would often say that like, I prefer what's what I would call the secondary leadership position where I get to be right under somebody who's going to tell everybody what to do and I can advise them if they need some advice, but I very rarely like to be the one who has to go out and give control. And even on my Discord server, I hired an ENTJ to be my moderator to just deal with everything. I was just like, I don't want to deal with this. So like, <laughs> you deal with all the people and the the things that need to be done on the server and I'll just be here and do my thing. <laughs> yeah, I think behind the scenes, I agree with that. I prefer to be behind the scenes, whatever, whatever leadership position it is. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I tend to gravitate toward those positions personally, I think that where, you know, when we're talking about a project that is meaningful in a sort of FI kind of way, then then yes, for sure. If it's if it's not so meaningful, then um, there's a lot I, I feel like I've gotten better at sort of outsourcing a lot of things that need to be done. But in general, I definitely agree that I prefer to be uh, behind the scenes keeping things together. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the past two. And the my very first boss of like my big kid job um, was an ENTJ and um, I was kind of, he ended up really like pulling me up in the ranks of this company to work really basically right alongside him. And it was such a great working relationship because I could go and I could make things work. I could like, you know, put all the plans together and then I could just hand it over to him and then he would deal with all the people and it was just it was perfect like it was a seamless relationship and it worked so well for him because he didn't want to have to you know be behind the closed doors and like have to actually go through how everything was going to work and he wanted to go and hype the, the people up and he wanted to go and like get everyone going on their things and it's like for myself it's like i want the most amount of i want to be able to implement the most amount of like change and have the most amount of influence with the least amount of like interpersonal like you know workings and um that's ideal right but also what i've learned through that process and that's kind of like my default and that's what i'll always kind of gravitate towards but at the same time it's like you know as i've progressed through my years i realized that you know having to be able to deal with people and having to make connections like face to face and communicate well um in real life with people it's a part of the game as well and that was a hard lesson to learn because that same boss, he took me to this like networking event 
And I, I was probably like, you know, 22 at the time. I thought I was going to die when I was there because there was just so many people, so many people wanted to shake your hand, wanted to know what you do and all this. And I, it was a lot. And um, so, you know, after that, he never brought me to one again because I think it was pretty clear how I was feeling on the situation. But, um, you know, and while that's always a direction I'll gravitate towards, I've seen the value of being able to connect on a personal level and strive to be more like someone who can behave like that. Yeah, I, I think a big, at least for me, like a big part of the not wanting to be the main leader person has to do with the lower SE, like being able to just pivot in the moment and just handle stuff coming at you in the moment and a problem and someone raising their hand and it, you know, it's like just the thought, I mean, besides the fact that I don't want to be held responsible if sometimes for how the work turns out, if I can't do it my little perfectionist way, then I don't want to do it at all. Or I just want to do it whispering in someone's ear. But, but a lot of the leadership, the thing that scares me about leadership is like being in front of a big group, telling them what to do and having someone like argue back with me or having something that I said, and then it didn't work. And I'm like, I don't know how to set up that kind of video camera. Sorry. Like something that like happens and I just have to respond suddenly. That is not my strong suit. And so it's like the planning and this putting things into place carefully. That's, you know, that's easy. But, but the part of just dealing with life as it happens, like predicting what's going to happen. That's, I can, I can deal with that. But if something happens that what, that I didn't predict, that that stinks that's hard yeah that's a really interesting point to mention about like intjs don't want to be in the leadership position that requires them to use se too much so it's like if i just have to react to things as they're coming at me like that's not the ideal place but to be able to be like the behind the, the behind the scenes leader to be like the secondary leader it allows them to not deal with all the se chaos that's just happening randomly and it allows them to plan and to have like some sort of um, NI and TE ability to order their environment. And it's it's interesting. Uh, another thing I'm, I'm noticing about this group of INTJs is that you, you guys are so TE in the sense that um, you're all, you've, you've all taught each other how to mute your mic while there's noise in the background. I'm like, I have not like set that rule at all, but you guys knew it was like the best way to like like most efficient way for to mute the mics so then when the person talks there's no background noise and i was like that thank you te <laughs> so yeah um and jasper do you have any thoughts on this yeah first I, I wanted to speak to you said there's been use of the the term the secondary leader or the the leader behind the leader and i I don't think they're a secondary leader. I think they're the true leader, the person who's really pulling the strings. And all INTJs will know that, and maybe they're hesitant to admit it and reveal their secret, but most INTJs are the ones in control. And we've found people that <laughs> either we work well with or that can be manipulated. And that sounds like a, a negative word. Manipulation has a lot of negative connotations, but a person that can be influenced in the right ways to see to it that our goals and agenda are carried out. And they're usually good goals and they're like well thought out and it is a, a nice pairing when you can find uh, someone that can complement your skill set in that way. But I also, I've long been fascinated with leadership as a concept and I, I have a master's degree in leadership studies. And so it, it's something that I've, I've definitely, <laughs> I've definitely tried to approach it from a few different perspectives, both like an academic perspective, but then also experientially and I grew up with my mom's a, an ETJ, and so having this very dominant TE energy all the time has been certainly an influence and an impact in how my own development. But it was it was never her specifically saying you should go out and seek this leadership position or you should do this. It was always this under. She always was stating people are looking to you, and you're setting the example. So always be very you know cognizant of how how you're performing, and so that uh it reminds me of a story i was in pre-k like k3 or k4 and i was on the playground and i always loved to climb on the outside of like metal structures just to you know it was fun it was very se playful and uh, a girl in my class started to follow me like she got on the outside of this like this bridge that was up 10 12 feet in the air and then she fell off and broke a bone and so I really <laughs> internalized that, wow, I, I'm setting an example. People are going to be copying what I'm doing. And so I have to, I have to wield that power carefully. And so 
when I was in um, elementary school, there we had a, a student council, which is you know the student government equivalent, and you only third through fifth graders could be on the student council. And each year, every class would elect one person to be their representative. And so for third and fourth grade, I, of course, was elected the representative because I pushed to have that level of control over how we would allocate our, our student council budget. And I was so excited for fifth grade because that's the year you become eligible to be the student council president. And we had a, an unusual situation where in fourth grade, our teacher loved our class so much that she went up the grade with us and went and taught our fifth grade as well. And so we're in our fifth grade, it's the beginning of the year, we're, we're holding our elections and someone has the audacity to raise their hand and ask, do we have to pick the same representatives as the previous year? And I'm thinking, oh no, I immediately saw that this was not gonna be good. And the teacher's like, oh no, we don't have to. In fact, it'd be great if we picked different representatives. And so two of my friends were elected the, the male and female representative for the class. And that was, and this is a super privileged thing to say, so let me acknowledge that up front, but that was, what I remember as being one of the like first major disappointments in my life. And so like getting home from school that day and crying because I didn't get to student council, which means I couldn't be president, which my whole trajectory in life changed in, in that moment. <laughs> I think my teacher was in the NFP, of course. That hurts, Jasper, that hurts. Yeah. Do you have her name and address? Cause we could get together and arrange something. I, well, uh, I'll leave that out of it. I hope this, uh, yeah. <laughs> she might actually see this someday. So <laughs> she'll need to know what she did. Yeah, That's... it's always a pain when some big plan falls through. Earlier this year, I had a big research. I was going to publish my first academic paper with a research study, and then COVID hit. I was, I, was, I was about to launch it, and they canceled the whole thing. And I was like, well, there goes my entire yearly plan. <laughs> That's the worst. Yeah, the NI is like, it has this trajectory that it wants, and then like life just hit smacks that trajectory in the face, and you're like, oh. <laughs> but yeah. It's interesting, the leadership conversation. Um, what I learned from it was that like INTJs like or orchestrating things, like orchestrating and re resource allocating, but not so much of the um, dealing with all of the minor sidetracks. And so, and the people like and their grievances it's like i'd rather not <laughs> but um it seems like there's this mastermind tendency of intjs to like that element of organizing and i think also not to care much about the credit maybe i mean not to like that's that is like a pretty much zero motivation to me i feel like i've done well because it went well anyone can see like people can see the, like the choir number i put together sounded great the last thing I need is someone saying, and we'd like to thank Melissa for her. I don't want that. I mean, it's good if they feel that way. That makes me happy if they come up afterward and tell me how thankful they are or, or you know, give me some nice feedback. That's great. But I do not want public acknowledgement. I don't care if my name's on the program. Stuff like that is just, it's not important. It's not a motivation uh, at all. Okay, that's fascinating. Because then, it, then my question for you guys is, how do you feel like when people compliment you? Like, because uh, Melissa was talking about it, so. I don't like it. I couldn't agree with Melissa more. I don't want to be recognized or, or anything that has to do with recognition, awards, anything like that. I just, I, I, I honestly don't like it. I don't feel comfortable with it. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily explain why articulately. But, um, and when it comes to compliments, I mean, it's fine. Like, like Joyce, you like compulsively compliment people. And I think it's like charming and it's, it's good. Um, in a public setting, like, I just, I don't know. I, I am generally, it depends who it is, but even with compliments, I'm generally uncomfortable with it because then I just feel like it's weird. I feel beholden to the person that in some sense, I feel like I have to like, like, do I have to compliment this this person back now? And I have so many nice things to say, but like, is this, but I just don't feel comfortable saying them and can, can't we just leave this unspoken? It seems not genuine in some in some sense, even if it is. So I think that's that's maybe a little like pathological, but but um, but yeah, in, in general, I couldn't I couldn't agree with more with what Melissa just said. I don't know about about you guys. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I, I thought about this one a little bit um, because I realized how uncomfortable it made me. And like, 
it, to the point where I've, I've said the stupidest things before when someone has given me a compliment and I'm just like, I'll, I'll think back later, like how, why were those the words that I chose to say afterwards? But what I think it is, is the fact that um, if we do something that's really, you know, seen as great or amazing, what I want to get the recognition is the thing and not the self. And so I think that's where it's almost like, it's almost like we want to be like, no, don't give me that. Give it to the thing that was created because that is where we see, like that is where our energy has gone. Like that is where the completion, that is where the vision has gone into. It's not me, it's it. And so I think for myself, it's like when I'm like getting the credit, it feels as though the credit has kind of gone towards the wrong, the energy is going to the wrong place basically. And um, and that's where I think for myself, I, I get uncomfortable and not unhappy, but it's like, um, you know, I, I just want it to be somewhere else, like where, because it's important for me to see it there versus here. Yeah, I completely agree with that actually, like 100%. I, I very much want the thing that I'm working on to receive the credit instead of me as an individual. I mean, it's nice from time to time. I'm not gonna say I don't like entirely getting the occasional compliment. But um, it is very uncomfortable, usually. I'd almost rather be criticized, especially if it's in some sort of professional place. I'd rather have something to work on or work towards. Okay, I feel, I feel uncomfortable I feel uncomfortable complimenting Lindsay on that, but that was a spectacular way to, <laughs> to put that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think, I think I like, some of it, uh, like, at least for me, I think some of it is like, these are like the lower down functions, like, the FI and the SE. So there's the element of like, if it's public, it's in the moment. And like, maybe I didn't know it was going to happen or, but also like, like I put my FI out there to create this thing. And so it's already feels vulnerable to me. Uh, but then people are going to watch me if they say, Melissa, you did a wonderful job with this. And I'm like, like, Jarvis, what do I do? Like, there's like an emotional, like if I respond like in an emotionally very genuine way that feels sort of like, that's private. Like, that's my emotions. Like, let me just keep my my little emotions in here. Like, it's like, that's just not, that's not where I live. That's not a part of myself that I'm good at, like projecting out there and giving back to people. So like feeling like I'm on the spot to have an emotion, which is like, thank you or whatever it's supposed to be. Uh, you see, I can't even think of what it's supposed to be. But yeah, it's it's a it's a really uncomfortable, feels like a really uncomfortable moment. It's like quite fascinating how like Chris talked about how it's more comfortable like to be criticized than be, to be complimented sometimes. And I was like, wow, thinkers, man, <laughs> they can really take that criticism and not take it personally. I don't know, as a feeler, like um, I might I'm I'm more likely to take it personally because I'm I, I expect that emotional exchange. So I'm like, if you're not like giving me that back and forth of good feelings, it, there there's something wrong going on there. And then that's what I would automatically assume. So for you to be OK with criticism is very different than than me. Also, Jasper, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, regarding criticism specifically, I would say that it's only appreciated when it, it comes from an informed place. Like, yeah, that I feel like oftentimes I'll get compliments for the things that I, I really didn't need to be affirmed. I'm like, oh, I really wish you'd actually spoken to this cool thing that I did and that I'm very competent in, but you don't notice because you don't, if you're not the one doing it, you don't, you often don't understand what it, what it takes to put something together or to, to make something happen. But similarly from the criticism side, there is they're like oh well you just if you could do this better and i'm like you you think i didn't think about those exact problems and i asked for these resources and you failed me so it's who's really at fault here and <laughs> of course i can also gracefully receive some criticism where they're like i believe everyone does have room for improvement all the time uh but yeah i'm, I'm probably pretty selective with who i'll receive le legitimized criticism from yeah, it definitely has to feel like deserved if someone's just coming up and, you know, yelling at you, essentially. It's not the same thing as if constructive criticism would have been a better way to say it, I guess. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much. That's really interesting. So that brings me to another topic. Uh, so for you guys, who will you listen to criticism from? Like, who will you take advice from? Anybody. Anybody. I mean, it depends on what the content of what they're saying is. Like, I don't, yeah, I, I wouldn't look at the status or like the, you know, how much authority someone has necessarily or like 
Uh, I mean, what what are they saying? You know, it, I mean, it's a difference between criticism and advice because you said both. When it comes to advice, I think anybody can have good advice. I would say I tend to judge people individually for their competency. And if I deem someone as competent, I'm more likely to listen to them. Like my old PhD mentor um, was somebody that like, if he gave me advice, I almost always just listened to it because he was exceptionally competent in what he did. And I trusted his word. But other than that, it's very rare for me to just take something without at least putting my own perspective on it, taking it from all the different angles and seeing what it's about. The way I see it, um, or the way that I take it in usually is, I feel as though NI has its little like files of information that have like, you know, they have like 10, 10 sheets of paper within it, and maybe we're missing like one or two. And so I'll listen to everyone's, you know, feedback or their advice or their opinion, like I'll, I'll, I'll hear it. Um, but unless it's filling one of those pieces of paper that's missing in that file, because like I know, like I know when there's something missing, and then I also know when I find it. So then when I find it, if someone like says something, and I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, that totally fits within this file. I'll take that information and I'll run with it. But if it's if it's not hitting any of the files that I got going on right now, then I'm just like, okay, you know, thank you, but it's I'm not going to use it because it's not relevant to any of the contextual information I'm currently working with. Um, I think uh, I'm really open to input and advice before the fact. Like if I'm putting something together, if I'm making something, if I'm building something, I'll ask a lot of people, hey, what do you think about this? So what do you think about that? But once it's already done, I know whether it worked or not. And so uh, the advice comes from the thing, from what I see. Ooh, that didn't work. That didn't work. I'm going to tweak that a little bit. And the next time I do it, it'll be better. And so if someone comes up and points out to me something that I already knew wasn't working, uh, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like I feel like the the best time to give me advice if you want me to hear the advice without feeling defensive or criticized is definitely as I'm putting it together and I do readily ask. I feel like I ask a lot when you know when the time is right, when I think the opinions could be useful. Uh and I know what the good resources are usually to ask. But yeah, like the the critique afterwards for me is is a little harder to harder to take unless unless I ask for it. It can be kind of a little painful. Yeah, so there's some really interesting points made. Um, how Melissa says like, you trust people's more opinion like before you do it and figure out if it works because after you do it, you already know if it works or not. So if someone tells you something, it's kind of redundant because you, you already know the outcome. So you don't need their input. So it's already filled that file that Lindsay was talking about. So like, why would you need that piece of information? Um, but it's like so it seems like INTJs kind of like know when information is like kind of redundant to their cause or relevant to their cause and it seems like uh, Chris he pointed out a really interesting fact about how like um he kind of knows like the competency levels of people and like who to take advice from and like if it's his PhD um person that he really respects like he'll take advice from that person and it's interesting because it goes back to Dario Nardi's work so Dario Nardi says that TE users if you scan their brain um they're more likely to listen to people who they think are have authority in that subject um so TE users naturally like look at like the competency levels of each person as they're listening and you can see it in the brain scans but what Michael said also makes sense because um, listening to everybody is like, it's also like INTJs are perceiver doms too. So they're going to have that open space to just listen to you as well. So how about you, Jasper? What is your opinion on this? <laughs> I was just going to echo back that because NI is this vortex that's just always sucking in information and we can never really feel like we have enough. Uh, advice fits into that. That's a type of information and that that feels really useful to have. And that's the first thing I'm, I'm doing before I'm trying to, to learn a new skill or to create a project. It's what is what has been done before, what are all the things that other people are saying. And that I, I think we should clarify though that even though TE is sometimes associated with doing a status check to see if the person is credible enough to give sort of information, it's less about sort of their their actual status in society or the position that they hold. It's just, do they have authority enough within this domain to give credible advice? That that could be anyone, but they, they have to demonstrate that they're worthwhile, a worthwhile voice to add into the repertoire. Uh, yeah. So. 
I'd like to echo that by just saying I met plenty of people at my university who I would not take advice from, even at like the PhD level. It, it doesn't boil down to their credentials. It boils down to their individual competency. And that's the important thing for me, at least. Yeah. Along with that, if there's ever a person like, let's say it's not like I don't have a project that's inviting, you know, criticism or advice at that time, but I'm in an environment or I have access to a person that I know is really, really exceptional at something. They have a, a mind bank of something that I'm either interested in in some respect, or like they're just really great at whatever that is. It's like, I want to zone in and like, get their best information and then have that in my pocket. Cause it's like, I know that in my lifetime, it'll, I'll probably never have nearly as close to the amount of like gems of information as they do. So if I'm able to grab like their five best and like put those in my back pocket for when I could use them in the future, um, I will go and I will search those people out or I'll, I'll try to connect with them. But those are like, I mean, it, that rarely happens, but occasionally like, um, I met this this guy who was a um, mathematician. He did all these um, math equations that like led them to solving these cases over in Switzerland with like there being um, poison putting in through these like um, drain holes and like all this crazy stuff. And he used math to find all these solutions to how they were doing this. And um, immediately I was like, okay, like I want to know your most like relevant information just because of the experiential knowledge and just the knowledge in general um and then it's that's what engaged me in the conversation that's what made me want to um get their advice and their perspective it's really perspective i think on certain things um so then i could you know take that with me and go along my way yeah that's fascinating lindsay about how you try to like mine people's mind banks and i wonder if that's why intjs score us enneagram five a lot because like they're sucking in that information and that's highly associated with type five so it might cause that correlation where a lot of intjs um, identify as type five and so my question for you guys is what is what are your pet peeves i've got Little pet peeves. Can I expand on one thing on that previous question real quick? Because it For just sure. came to mind. I wanted to say that one thing I really like to do is seek out people who have very different either types or mindsets than myself if I'm looking for advice. Uh, for example, I have an ENFP friend who I'll go to just because like, it's very easy as an NI dom to get stuck in your own little tunnel vision and ignore all these potential things that could be way better. And if, when I go and talk to him, it's like, oh, well, did you think of this? And it's like, wait a second, I didn't think of that. That's way better. And then, you know, you, then you can shift the tunnel vision to a different track and move down that thing. But. Yeah, that's a really good point about how like NI by itself, sometimes it's like stuck in its still, like what it sees. And the thing is like to have an any user, like say the possibilities, sometimes it helps expand your view. Like my best friend's an ENFP. And when she says something, I realized how many bases I've left in the dark and that I've left missing because I was so focused on this like idea that this abstraction that I cared about, that I was missing all of these other ideas that were also interesting and should be in co considered too. Um, so yeah, totally, completely agree. And so to our question. <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> of, uh, so yeah, guys, um, what are your pet peeves? When people mix the dips at Mexican restaurants, <laughs> it stresses me out. <laughs> always has it's, it's the weirdest little pet peeve i have maybe it's just like a re repressed sensing thing but like if you get guacamole in my cheese dip i'm gonna fight you <laughs> it's funny because it's been such a te conversation so far that like this is the question where you're really like punching at fi and i felt like this <laughs> jolt of electricity when you asked the question i'm gonna hold off for now i don't want to alienate half your viewers but like if there's a we could go on we could do a whole um <laughs> a whole conversation about this. I mean, I think my biggest problem in in life, get ready for it, is the garden hose because it drives me nuts because I, I have this big garden and I'm always trying to water. I mean, I love watering. It's so like I've made these beautiful flowers in this kingdom of order and beauty. And so I go out and I'm watering and then I'm like, ah, ah, tugging and like got stuck in the flower pot on the porch. And I'm like yanking. Like it's, it's like little things like that that are so stupid that I ignored them before because who wants to sit around thinking about stupid things? And then when I'm trying to do my thing, 
the stupid thing I ignored is like, ah, I'm still there, I'm still there. It's just so frustrating. There are many garden hoses in my life, but I'll stop with the garden hose right now. So I'll do like one that's, one that will be more superficial and then one that's more serious. So like my more superficial pet peeve, um, I think it'll kind of go along with that category is um, Melissa's, but like it's um, packaging on things that like you can't open up. That's like, it's made for a human to open and it's literally impossible unless you have a pair of scissors or a knife or something like that. And even just the other day, what I, I think it was um, a set of like lights that go outside and I'd ordered them online and it's like, I did not have a knife. And it's like, how am I supposed to open up this package that with like the plastic and the paper on the outside and the whole thing. And it's just like, it's just frustrating. It's like a human is supposed to open this. What if it's a grandma? What if it's an old person who doesn't have a knife with them or a pair of scissors? And here I am struggling as this young human. <laughs> it's almost impossible. So that's like my like small frustration pet peeve. I would say like my, the one that is like the recurring one that eats at me at the end of the day a lot of times is um, when people will have like, they're great ideas and they're great like, oh, we could do this or this could happen or whatever. And it's like they're not thinking about the integrations that would actually be required to actually make that happen. And then they just push it off as easy. They're like, okay, you ready to go do it? And everyone's like, oh. and then I'm like, no. Like how could you even think that you could just throw that out there <laughs> with all these other components that are actually involved to make it happen? Um, and so I think it's it's, that is a pet peeve of mine, is when people just assume things as being easy because they haven't taken the time or energy or effort to think about what's actually involved to complete it and make it happen. Totally. Badly thought through things are annoying, <laughs> indeed. How about you, Jasper? Yeah, so I was going to speak to that as well. I was going to say that before I understood personality type, before I had any understanding that I was an INTJ, I would get so frustrated with people's short-sightedness. And I it it was so perplexing to me how people weren't seeing the natural outcome of, of the decisions they were making. And it it took quite some time to develop any level of understanding and empathy around that. Um, but I also wanted to speak to what Lindsay said about having the, when you experience a frustration and it's like, that's when it triggers my FI and I'm like, gosh, this sucks. But then I immediately also extrapolated out, I'm like, how do any people that have it worse than me, how are they gonna deal with this? And that that applies to not just opening boxes, but any sort of societal issue. I'm like, I'm an extremely, I'm in a visually privileged group uh, most of the time by most metrics. And so anytime I face something, I'm like, how how are other people going to experience this far worse? And it, it, it gets to this, one of my like core values of justice and fairness and feeling so strongly around that that's allowed to exist or that's able to exist and how much worse it is for for other people that have to maybe experience something similar or something worse. I really related to that, Jester. Um, my biggest pet peeve is short-sightedness too. I cannot stand short-sightedness and like just like having people not consider like long-term out outcomes, like it, it like destroys me. And I like, it's probably like my major life problem too and like where I, um, what, what I judge people for also goes in that domain too. It's always like, I'll, I'll figure it away, but it always relates back to like the sense of short-sightedness because I think like it just took like two more seconds of thought and you didn't have to do that. And you didn't have to cause all these ripples. You didn't have to cause all those domino effects to go. And it's like, I'm, I'm hard on people for their short-sightedness. And because it comes so naturally to me to see a little more head. And so, but I don't notice that it's maybe harder for other people. So what happens is I end up um, being either resentful or judging others for like a sense of short sightedness. Yeah. I mean, I feel like w when you asked the question, I was talking about that electricity because we were talking about temper earlier and how we're very even tempered on the outside. And that's very, that's a very TE kind of presentation, but there are so many things that get me, that get me riled up to the point where I'll just, I'll just rant about them and go on like an ad advertising advertising i mean just any kind of brainwashing or manipulation that i see but like especially advertising just because like we're we're just we're swimming in it always 
Uh, calling people consumers makes me absolutely just drives me up the wall. Anytime anybody refers to people as consumers happens all the time. Any idea of common sense. There's no such thing as common sense. There's a genealogy behind anything you call common sense. And don't tell me that I should be doing something just because you feel like everybody knows that it should be done this way. Um, people saying reactionary when they mean reactive, that drives me crazy. People who say begging the question when they mean raising the question makes me crazy. Um, watching people self-sabotage, you know, is something that, something that I wouldn't necessarily call that a pet peeve, but it's something that really gets me, really gets me worked up and just kind of like sad because you feel like it's, it's really hard to make it right when someone's doing that. People arguing who talk past one another and like, are just like, they're talking about different things and you want to step in and just like clarify, like, no, you need to, you need, you're looking for this and you're talking about that. Which, which you see, I mean, just, you know, like open Facebook any day, like, I, I mean, there's so many, there's so many things that like, I just, yeah. So, I mean, again, like these things happen and I'll be very like, you know, I'll, I'll probably stay stoic on the, on the outside, but like it, I get, I get worked up about some, some very specific things, but also some things that just like, I'm just seeing just all the time that like, you you have to you have to get it out because it will like you know you, you can like get really wound up about these things and then just be at home and pacing in the kitchen and thinking about them and having arguments with people who aren't there and doing it, you know those those kinds of things so I would, pandora's box <laughs> that was lovely are any other of you like constipated with pet peeves like michael is feel free to unleash it well, I was going to say to um, <laughs> to his point of talking about self sabotage is like, I mean, when he said that, I was just like, amen, like that one, because um, I think with you know with NINTEs, like you'll easily see people's, you'll easily see cycles in people's behavior, um, and you'll easily see like the recurring problems that are going that are they're going through, and you see them walk through it over and over again. And to me, it's like, it hurts my soul almost at a level to be like, I see you suffering with these patterns in your life. And I see you not making the decisions to be able to get out of them and change them. And it's like, it angers me on this deep level, but it's also like, I want to fix it. Um, and then it's like, oftentimes you'll try to fix it, but then it has to do with like, you know, how receptive that person is to, you know, change and, you know, whatever you're conveying to them. And, uh, but yeah, self-sabotage through patterns, I would say I mean, that's a huge one. And I rant to that um, myself all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really interesting thought, Lindsay, about the cycles. I, like, I actually really, really, really relate to that. Um, so I, I, I think it goes back to Jasper's point about like short-sightedness too, when people don't consider that like cycles are reoccurring it's a part of their short-sightedness it's like oh so you don't see it as like a pattern right you just like well so they're not like registering the pattern that happens in their life over and over again yeah i'm just like haunted by how jasper said like it's like short-sightedness that is his pet peeve and i'm like i'm probably going to think about that for the next year to like flesh it out in my mind because i'm like that is so true for for me because it's like I, I think things through so completely that when other people don't, it almost feels like they're negligent in some way. But as an INFJ, the cycles that I care about are more about like interpersonal dynamics. So I see people wrecking like the harmony in their relationships and like self-sabotaging that way. And I'm like, it was totally preventable. And like, this is a reoccurring cycle in your relationships, like that, that dynamic between you two that you could have, like if you paid more attention to that person's needs and your needs, you could find like a common ground between both your needs. And then I'm stuck in like lamenting about people's short-sightedness. It always just goes back to that. So you hit like a core thing, Jasper, and I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> I also wanted to speak to this unrelated to short-sightedness, another pet peeve. And this really speaks to more of my relationship to SE where it feels pretty binary where I'll be extremely sensitive to overwhelming sensory stimuli like annoying music or lights being too bright and those sort of things that you might notice if, if you walk into a room and, and those are present. But then there's also this completely flipped where I'm so in my head that I've 
I'm completely out of awareness of what's happening around me. I've contorted my body into like the most reclined position possible. My feet are up on, like in the air because that just felt right. And uh, the switching between like being so frustrated by the most minor things, SE wise, and then being completely oblivious. And so there's not even a consistency. So it feels embarrassing that I can't even say that universally these always frustrate me because sometimes I will not be tapped into that. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you mentioned like the sensitivity to sensation. I'd have to say my biggest, single biggest pet peeve when it comes to other people, and this is, it, it seems shallow, but it's being touched. I, I, won't, I don't let anybody except my wife touch me at all. Uh, and, if, and if you want to elicit a response from me, as kind of Michael talked about opening the floodgates a little bit, um, that's how you can do it with me pretty easily. Um, I don't know if that's just a repressed SE thing, sensitivity to touch or something, but <laughs> for me, that's a no-go. I would say maybe one more thing that for us, I, mean, I don't know if I'd put it exactly in the category of pet peeve, but one more thing that really causes me a lot of like inner turmoil is, um, is I guess like wasted potential, wasted opportunity. And that, I mean, that's kind of across the board because I can see it really fast. Like I can see a gift or a talent in somebody. Um, and so seeing that misused or not used or just thrown away, um, either in it. I mean, it doesn't even have to be like in someone I'm personally working with. It can be like a movie star that like goes off the deep end. And I'm like, oh, but their performance in this thing, they could have been in so many more movies. They wasted that. They threw that away. It's so frustrating. Or like, you know, students who don't work hard that have like a gift for math or something like that. And I'm like, it doesn't matter if you have a gift for math, if you don't like show it and you don't like develop it and you don't. So like under underdeveloping talents and even even to the point of like uh when it's a beautiful day outside and i have some and i live in oregon where there's not as many beautiful days outside and so when, when it's gorgeous outside and it's like just the perfect time of night and then there's i have to do something somewhere inside i'm just like oh why couldn't i do this exact thing and transfer it to february when it's raining like it's so frustrating that it's a beautiful day and i'm wasting that beautiful day and there's other times when it wouldn't have mattered if it was a beautiful day you know it wouldn't have been a beautiful day and i could have done this thing so just like every second my mind is like putting out little feelers for like potential and productivity and like maximizing things um but it's like in a very cerebral way it's not just like well i'm just gonna throw it out there and just have fun and enjoy this moment it's like which moment would I enjoy the most? Is it this? Is it that? I don't know. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Like, it's a very, like, uh, it's just a constant struggle for me uh, to always be be thinking in those terms and, like, the potential of every moment, the potential of myself, the potential of my children and my students. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that is really, really, really like it's really fascinating to hear about INTJs and what annoys them. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll make sure to never mix my cheese dip with my guacamole around them. <laughs> so any other pet peeves before we move on to the next topic? I mean, I guess this one probably goes back to what we talked about earlier with control, but being stuck under somebody who's kind of incompetent in work is definitely a pet peeve where you have to like deal with someone who you could see they're like not maximizing the way that we could be doing the work and you you can't even like explain that to them because they're like four steps up in competency or management or status or something. That's always annoying. I worked retail for six years, so I experienced a lot of that. Yeah. Or, or you can explain it to them and then deal with the consequences of that. Exactly. Email or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Dealing with like unqualified people is really tough on the T. <laughs> so my next question for you guys is, what is an understated quality about INTJs? So what in the when you read the profile description, what do you feel like they're leaving out about you guys? I'd say when it comes to the competence um, issue that there's a lot that there's a lot of times it's I think it's another thing about compliments too, where where we will get complimented for either like knowing a lot or or getting something done in a way that, oh my God, how did you do that? When really the answer is that a system is set up and like, I didn't know that thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think we're really good at like furtively Googling things to get information in the middle of a conversation and stuff like that, or to have our details in order so that like, you know, I can, I can refer to the right, um, um, 
database <laughs> where I can get this piece of information. If I'm in the middle of an argument, oh, let me let me text my friend real quick and get the information. That I want. So I think there's a lot, there, there's not, not a lot, but there's sometimes like this idea that we have like so much up here that we just have random access to. But I don't know about every, everybody else, but in a lot of cases, I feel like kind of a fraud with it because I'm just like, yeah, so 1862, there was, a, you know what I mean? And um, so that would be that would be one thing if that's how we're defining understated. I don't know if that's just me though, guys. I mean, I think a lot of it is like just knowing what knowing what good resources are and knowing when to use which resource. I think that's kind of what you're what you're speaking to. Yeah, I have. Um, when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, it brought this story back directly to my brain. A, a few years ago, um, through my job, I had to go to this like um this like large county hearing related to biodiesel and like in this thing and whatever anyway i was just supposed to go to like be there with my company and like we weren't actually supposed to talk or anything like that and then my boss is like Lindsay, i want you to go up there and like talk on like our behalf and i was like oh gosh like really like i like right now and um and so i was like okay and so right um right before me the guy who was like the expert on biodiesel for like the Southeast was speaking, right? And I'm technically on the other side. And so as he's talking, I'm like Googling counter arguments, like things that I think would fit as a counter argument to what he's saying, um, even though they're not literally like, I was formulating it that way. And so I was like going through, I was making notes for myself and then like I went up and I had to go talk and it really sounded like I knew what I was talking about. Um, and afterwards, <laughs> the people from my company were like, we didn't know you knew so much about biodiesel. And I was like, literally like right before I was consuming the information so that I could, you know, deliver that piece. But um, I think that's like, an, that's an NITE thing too, of being like, what are the most important pieces I can pick and push together to make this point right now, you know? And so, but when you said the whole Google thing, I was like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Yeah, I heavily relate to that. There's been so many times where someone will ask me a question and inside I'm like, I have no idea, but Google knows and I'm sure I could find an answer in about 20 seconds. So, and then they'll be like, wow, I can't believe you knew that. <laughs> so, if you know, it's the 21st century. If you know how to find information, it's just as good as knowing it, in my opinion. Oh. I mean, I think there's a, there's something to like TE versus TI a bit where I feel like I don't need to take the time to thoroughly understand things always. Like, I mean, a math problem, if I can figure out like the trick to do that kind of math problem, you know, in school, I would never really take the trouble to really deeply understand why that worked. A lot of it's just like, I just want to get a good score on the test. This isn't my top priority right now. I don't really need this. So it's just a matter of like skimming the surface, like doing what it, like I know how to present myself as like a an intelligent person most of the time, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have like that deep well of knowledge underneath where I think, I feel like TI is a lot more like, sometimes they might not always come forward and like be the smart guy talking like, but underneath, like they really took a lot of time and trouble to figure something out and understand it thoroughly. Um, but it's like an introverted thing. So maybe we don't see it on the outside as much. Yeah. Like with, with TI, it, it's, kind of like difficult because like with some straightforward questions um like with my ti like sometimes it can be hard to answer it's kind of vague but um antonia dodge once had an example about like going on the highway and like needing to know a piece of information about like the highway route and stuff and like what the name of a certain thing was to fit it in with all of the other ti pieces but like ti is kind of random in that sense because it needs that sp specific piece of information to fit into its ti understanding but it cannot tell you why it needs that piece of information. It just knows that it it's like, it's just a piece of knowledge I need. And so it can seem like TI can accidentally make others question its own, like, um, like its own well of knowledge because TI doesn't know how to tell you why it needs a certain piece of information because it's more of a, it, it just, it, it's creating something so personal that it's hard to really put into words. But um, but yeah, it's like a deep well of TI knowledge for the TI user. I, I'm trying to describe something that, that I feel inside. It's just really cryptic sometimes. But um, yeah, so Jasper, what is your experience with all of this? <laughs> Can we reiterate what the specific 
topic is that we're that you're wanting an answer to right now? Oh, uh, we're we're uh, talking about the understated quality uh, inside the INTJ descriptions. Like, what do you feel like is missing from INTJ descriptions? Well, I I, I think we did touch on this quite a bit early on in the session where the descriptions tend to lack a humanity. And while I can appreciate the cold efficiency of a robot, they really neglects our, our passion for things. And even though that can be externally not super vibrant, it, I think there is this deep well of, of concern and care for things and commitment to things and to values. And that that's, rarely described properly unless unless someone is an INTJ writing their description then I, I feel like an INTJ could probably write a great description for most types. Yeah that's such a good point point. Um, and any last thoughts on this subject guys? Just really quickly on that random access information point because I think there is type confusion between INTJs and INTPs and sometimes ENTPs. I've gotten that a few times from my, from myself, but I think that is a a point that it seems like we all agree with that. I see the NTPs, and I'm I'm jealous of it that random access wit that they can pull up. Whereas, I mean, I feel like we can do that, but there's more. Uh, it, it's more deliberative for us, and we just don't have it like it, it, at top of mind all the time. So I think that's definitely a TI FI kind of. Uh, or T-I-T-E kind of uh, differential there. For sure, and I realized, okay, so the reason why T-I has difficulty explaining its logic is because it, it's logic without an end goal. So it's logic, it doesn't have a concrete thing to tell you about what it's accomplishing with it. It's just like collecting knowledge. So it's logical process can be refined for further, but how can someone describe that to you? So if you like, if they, they're, they're not able to explain to you why they, want to know something, it's not because, like, it, it, the reason why is because they they cannot link it to the external world in any way, because it has nothing to do with a bearing on the external world, it doesn't really help you with a goal, or it doesn't help you, like, it's literally for the own mind, and because the TI user just has an intrinsic, intrinsic compulsive pull to rationalize and reason things, and that's the reason why they need that information. My next question for you INTJs is, what makes you feel alive and energized as an INTJ? I'll say authenticity. I mean, anything that's like the real thing, which is hard to describe. It's like, it could be, if it, whether it's a person or it's a piece of music or a conversation, a scent, just anything that, I, I'm kind of an idealist. So I feel like anything is always either approaching or falling away from like the platonic form of that thing. So like, I don't know, it's like if you've ever walked out of a movie and you're just like kind of floating and you feel kind of transported and you walk outside and it's 3 p.m. and you're like, what is, what, like time has lost its meaning is why I like to go to movies on my own. It's like almost, almost sublime. It's like, that's like the feeling that's really hard to describe of like having, how I feel like having approached like the real thing, the authentic thing. So it could be in any context, but like that feeling of just like, that's the, that's the, that's the thing. Heart, I, I'm, not, I'm not describing this well. So for me, something that makes me feel really like excited and alive, I guess, would be delving into the unknown or things that are very, very theoretical or coming as a theory out of something that I enjoy. Like when I'm trying or when I'm watching a TV show, a movie or something, and I'm trying to like figure out what's going to be the plot or what's going to happen near the end or what the underlying story is before it happens. That's something that gives me a lot of energy and excites me. And I enjoy YouTube channels like game theory and film theory, where they just talk about really just theories related to things that I enjoy. And that gives me energy personally. Yeah. With like the theoretical side, um, you know, sometimes I'll be like driving or something like that. And then I'll start going on, on, on a subject matter. And then I'll, I'll be thinking about the different ways that like, I'm like, Oh, I could explain things this way. And then these things would fit into really articulating like what I mean related to this thing. And so like, I'll start, um, you know, pulling together a roadmap to communicate something that's in my brain already. But it's like, I'm figuring out how to get that out like to the world sometimes. And, um, and so that's really energizing because it's like once one piece fits in, it's like all the other ones just start fitting right in after it, right? And so I'll be driving, I'll be doing 
like an audio message to myself so that I can go and like, you know, put it together in a different way when I get home or whatever it is. And so like, that's energizing. So I love the feeling when like all the pieces pull in together and it's just like this tight working, like piece of perfection that I just, I know once I feel it coming together, I know it's gonna work. Um, but then even more energizing than that is the fact like, so like you hone in the thing, the thing is good. You put the thing out there into the world. And then when someone comes back and they're like, I tried the thing and the thing worked, like just like you were saying it was gonna work, that is so um, gratifying because it's not like you just put out the thing and it just went off into like cyberspace, but like the thing was applied and it actually like worked the way it was supposed to because someone took the energy to you know actually try it or implement it or whatever. And that's so, that's just gratifying because you're like, I know this is going to work. Is anyone out there gonna give it a shot? You did? Awesome, like that's a great, that's a great feeling. I feel like I have a, a similar energizing piece that kind of relates to what Lindsay was just saying, where if I, we, I think most NI users will resonate with the fact that we don't, we can't actively force insights out. It's more of a sit back and let them, let them simmer to the surface. And so that moment when a new idea is presented, and sometimes it comes from within, like an NI sort of insight, but sometimes it's a new piece of information in the external world. I'm like, I didn't know this existed. This is incredible. I can now, I, I'm immediately seeing how I can fit this into my, my plans, how I can shift things around in a, in a new way. And it, it's, there's an excitement there with, oh, this could, this could be a better optimized trajectory that I was trying to create. And so um, that's, that's one sort of main, more of like top half of the cognitive function stack that is energizing. But if we look more at the bottom with SE, um, I, have always just really enjoyed these super in the body activities, like a like a trampoline park, it just feels so fun to me. And it unfortunately, like it, it's it's less fun as I've gotten older because it's just so jarring. Like you're just like this is headache central. You're just bouncing your body around in ways that they don't naturally move through the world. But I I love that the concept of just having full freedom to to like explore a physical space like that, and to to do something that's akin to like a, a ninja warrior course where you have to navigate some sort of obstacles and and you don't have a strategy in advance. You just like, you just feel out, this is how I'm gonna have to do it. And I feel like INTJs often, and this kind of relates to the previous question, there's an understated sense of competency related to their SE abilities. It, it's maybe not as sophisticated as someone with SE in the front seat, but uh, I think, INJs can have a pretty interesting and, and competent appearing usage of SE. And I, I guess one example for me is, um, I know that oftentimes people associate music with being more of an FI sort of piece, but I've come to realize very recently uh, in, in talks with my ENFP partner, she relates to music on such this deep FI level and it's like very personal and, and she wants to be alone when she's like singing or playing guitar. But when I when I pick up an instrument or if I want to sing, it's it's very much a collaborative. It's like, look what I can do. It's here, I'm putting this out into the world. And that might be growing up, um, my mom is one of seven kids. So anytime we were around that bigger extended family, people would just burst into song and it was just sort of expected, like that's what you're doing. So, um, it, I feel like I have a very SE relationship to music and making music and competency through the, the external production of music and less of this like deep feeling resonance with a lot of the music that I experience. And because I work as a musician, um, I think that's helpful in, in some ways because I'm not, I'm not shackled to the, I need to be feeling this music. I need to be super into this. Like this is a performance. I need to be able to present in a certain way. And so I do. Yeah, that's that's super fascinating. Um, how you talked about like an eye and how it needs like that to for that insight to kind of settle into their pond. And it's not it's not like hunting for ideas, but it's more of like uh, aligning your rifle with the idea. And then like or like I've I've heard someone say it before, like a defrosting mirror. So you and I is getting the mirror to defrost or waiting for the mirror to defrost so you can see the image clearly. So it's like 
getting that clear image. Um, and another way um, that they put it is like, um, any is like a machine gun and it rapid fires. Um, whereas NI, it's the sniper rifle waiting for that target to align perfectly with the sniper rifle vision. So that was a really good way of putting it, Jasper. And it's really interesting to hear about the things that you all have to say about what energizes you. So Melissa, what energizes you? <laughs> a few things. Uh, I have discovered rollerblading uh, at a rink inside and just going around and around as fast as I can when there aren't too many people there. I love it with all my heart, like listening to the music and uh, which brings me to a pet peeve, which is uh, that not everyone goes at the, not everyone leaves the rink when I get on. I mean, I don't like that. Uh, the chaos of like people randomly darting here and there when I'm like on my track and then someone comes and cuts in front or there's a kid who's like skating the wrong way toward their mom and I'm like, Ugh. like the, the level of frustration when I'm like in my zone and then something happens. I'm like, there need to be lanes on this roller skating rink, there need to be fiercer rules so that no one could ever do this to me ever again. Because what if I fall? If I fall, I'm a mom. I'm a mom of four kids. If I break my leg, anyway, I'm not even going to go through this. But the consequences of stopping me on the roller skating rink are, are terrible. And part of it is because I do feel so alive and happy uh, when I'm doing that. Um, I think also just anytime I can, when I see somebody in any context anywhere, uh, who's in their element, who's completely in their element. Uh, it's so exciting to me. And it doesn't really matter what the element is. It doesn't even matter if I know anything about the topic, you know, just seeing seeing somebody like, who's really, like, like my dad is this INTP and he's like very awkward in social situations. But then we go down to the, you know, float the river that's near my house and he just turns into this like, magical being who knows every single bird, every single tree, and knows just which rock to avoid with our boat and different things like that. And just seeing like, oh my gosh, if this was a movie, he'd be like the, the star of this movie in this at this moment. It's like perfect. And and it doesn't matter if it's him doing that or a podcaster who's just really good at doing podcasts. And I'm like, whoa. It's it's just so exciting to see like human potential at its very, very best. Uh, especially like, I think, especially in, in contexts where maybe no one else would even notice it. Um, uh, like on a playground with a bunch of elementary school kids playing and I see someone who's really, really good at corralling the other kids or making other people feel good or it doesn't matter what it is. I just, I love that feeling. That, I, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, I liked your talk about the lanes too. It's like, man, there's a better TE way to handle this, but like, it's just like, the people to their own chaos. Okay, great. It's a pet peeve. <laughs> but yeah, um, I loved hearing all of the things that energize you all. And so my last question for you all is, what advice would you give to other INTJs that are similar to you? What advice would you give to your younger INTJ self? Um, I would say that probably one of the things I wish I had known when I was younger was the fact that not everyone makes decisions based off reasons, that a lot of people make decisions based off whether they like it or not. And when I actually discovered that, I think I was floored for like a few months. Like I couldn't get over it. It was just, and then I realized and I like looked back at all these situations in my life and I'm like, I, in the past I hadn't, wasn't able to understand why like, okay, I, I gave like the relevant information like, it makes sense. Like, anyone could look at it and see that it makes sense. Why would they not make this decision? Why would they not go this way? It's clearly, like, it makes the most sense. And then I realized it had nothing to do whether it made sense or not. If someone didn't like it, they didn't like it. And they were going to choose it no matter what. And so discovering that at whatever age it was, I wish that would have been earlier in my life because then I could have just crafted my arguments and my statements in a way that... I was hitting both sides, the value side and the reason side, and that probably would have produced like some better results in you know working with different people and talking with different people. Um, and then also the fact that you do have to take some responsibility for the value spectrum like of the tribe. So like you know, as someone who has TE, we're going to prioritize like does this work or not? Is this working? Does that work? it work, you know? 
But at the same time is do people like it or not? Um, where are they at in their state of value and emotion? We just don't ping to that normally within our own mind frame. So I feel as if I was able to kind of start thinking about that earlier, it would have it would have just helped me get some things rolling in an easier, more efficient way because you know our brains aren't set there first. So that's my thought. I mean, uh, I think one thing that was very valuable to me as I kind of grew and learned and matured um, was learning to be more approachable. Uh, when I was young, especially in my teenage years, I was very like porcupiney. I, I was never a mean person, but I just didn't like interacting with people very much. And if people tried to bother me or waste my time, it was very easy for me to get frustrated and kind of learning just to get over myself uh, and be more approachable and talk to people and learn that everyone in the world has an interesting point of view. They may not always be right, but you can learn things from people that you think you would never learn from. Um, so that's been something interesting for me is just listening to people that you don't even think you should be listening to sometimes. <laughs> I would say that that's a very, very much been uh, a life discovery for me too. That's been huge because I always used to feel like, you know, like in the movies when like there's like love at first sight, that kind of like moment. I, I always used to feel like that with friends, you know, like I would always have one or two very, very good friends and everyone else was just all in the same category, which was just annoying, like just go away. I didn't, I didn't really see much of a purpose or a need um, for a lot of friends or even just acquaint like acquaintances or worst of all, like why would you have an acquaintance? There's no point. Like if you're not gonna have a deep conversation and bond for life, there's no point. And so uh, it, it was, it really was a discovery for me uh, when I started to realize it, it can be kind of fun sometimes to have a shallow interaction here and there. Like sometimes it feels good to like make friends that you might not keep for life or to walk into a room and have everyone say like, Hey, cause they're glad you're here, even though they're not your very, very best friend ever. Um, so I, I mean, I had to discover that I discovered it through, I needed, I moved to a new place and I needed a whole bunch of piano students really fast. And I wasn't getting them just through sitting at home being good at piano that just didn't do it. I had to make people like me. And so I had to like watch people who were likable and like imitate them and figure it out. And then suddenly like when people started to like me, I was like, whoa, they're sure they take from me sometimes, but they also actually give me momentum. And I didn't realize that it would give me momentum to have more people in my life. Um, and it gave me a lot more momentum and more energy. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad I figured that out. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I, the only thing I'd add is um, date, go on dates. Like, even if you know, even if you know, it's not going to work out, you know, because you have an eye, it's probably not going to work out like, you know, but like, it's good experience. And don't TE your relationships. Don't TE your relationships. It's bad, bad vibes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I ended up marrying an ENFJ because she found me. She, <laughs> she came to me, asked me out. <laughs> Then we got together. So yeah, it's most INTJs. I think that's one of the things they struggle with really is just getting into that romantic half of their lifestyle and feeling brave enough to interact with others and start the dating scene. So yeah, good point, Michael. And even aside from that, I mean, it has, it's like the one thing we haven't mentioned is that like a lot, a lot of us are pretty obsessive about managing our energy reserves. And it's like, it's such a commitment of energy that if everything's telling you like, well, this is gonna go to, you know, this isn't gonna gonna go very far. Like you, you will forego the experience in order to save the energy, but then you don't have like experience. So it's like, I think that's the other thing is don't be too obsessive about managing your energy reserves at the expense of life experience. That's a good point, Michael, about like the managing energy and about how like, I think it goes back to Lindsay's uh, point when she was talking about, you know, wanting relevant information and not wanting like redundant because it's also about like using your energy wisely because like you only have so much of it too. And so it's it's all about like energy and being intentional with how you use your energy reserves. And so Jasper, what, uh, what are your thoughts on this all? When you first posed the question of what advice would you have for other INTJs? My gut reaction is I'm really hesitant to advise INTJs on anything. I feel like that <laughs> INTJs don't appreciate unsolicited advice as we discussed. And so 
but when you said advice to my past self, that, that was a nice reframe. Um, I think a, a few really foundational pieces that would have been, or that have been game changers, but I could have, you know, if I had done it earlier, all the better. Uh, acknowledging that stoicism wasn't necessarily a virtue that I should like lean into. I was, I was very much embracing this. I don't feel, I shouldn't express feelings. Uh, I mean, part of that is is growing up in a culture that says men shouldn't express feelings outwardly. So it was, it was kind of li living into that, the expected narrative, but my life has become so much richer when I was willing to sort of lean more into that feeling side. Um, but also just acknowledging, and this is a foundational principle for any personality, typology, system or understanding, acknowledging that people are different. And so even if you don't understand how they're different, just acknowledging that they're not moving through the world the way that you are. I've tried to adopt a view that everyone is doing the best that they can. And if I view the world that way, it's, it's such a, a more generous and kind way to exist. And it, it leads not to me criticizing how someone's doing something or, or why didn't they think through this. It's what, what have they experienced? What's been a part of the system that has contributed to that ultimate expression? So uh, those are sort of the, the key things. And then something that's only very recently been something I've been willing to explore is that friendships with other INTJs, it, it's okay. I, <laughs> I've had this bias against INTJs because uh, I think the stereo, I believe the stereotypes. I was like, well, I'm an exception to the stereotype, but if all the other ones are like what they're saying, I, <laughs> I don't wanna be friends with those people. They seem cold, they seem unfriendly. And there, there are patterns of INTJs getting along really well with, with different types that aren't also INTJs. And so you don't often see like there's always the the golden pair, the INTJ, ENFP, but you don't you don't see those same sort of memes with two INTJs hanging out, being best friends, doing things together. But I I think there really is a, a special relationship that an INTJ can foster with another INTJ. It just uh, there's such a, a foundational understanding, and there's there's never going to be this expectation like, well you didn't you didn't message me quickly enough, and I. <laughs> we haven't hung out in weeks. It could be like a year and a half and I just reply back as if no, no time has passed. And they're like, yeah, what's, what's going on? So that's something I, I'm still hesitant. I'm not fully committed to the idea, but so far all the INTJs I've met in real life have disproved what I originally assumed about INTJs. Yeah, like you guys are a lovely group of INTJs and totally like friendly and like just a joy to listen to. And yeah, it, it was great t seeing like the INTJ solidarity here. I was, I loved hearing all of your like explanations and all of your little pet peeves. <laughs> they were very entertaining and interesting to listen to. And I really felt like I got to be in the mind of an INTJ for a few hours and it was like a privilege and a pleasure. And so do you guys have any last final thoughts, anything you'd like to talk about before we close this off? So I just want to say one more thing about the last question, which was the advice to the younger INTJs. One thing that I wish I had done more when I was younger is allowed myself to go and do the things that scared me, um, to experience the new, it, most of it like SE type stuff, where if I feel like I've had so many regrets where there was things that I could have gone and done, but like last minute or last day, I was like, no, I don't want to do this. I got invited to a tournament in Atlanta once and my friend didn't, he had to cancel because he couldn't go. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go by myself. And I'm going to do this. And then the day before, I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to drive seven hours to somewhere I've never been. But I wish I had. And I feel like maybe some of those new experiences can be good for allowing the NI to kind of have new things to process. Yeah, it's like um, Carl Jung talks a lot about how like there's the NI and the SE struggle where being too NI stops you from taking in new SE experiences because then you're hesitant to let in these new experiences that might, you know, you, you might not want. So it, it goes back to personality hacker and how they say like IJs, they care about invulnerability. So sometimes this invulnerability fixation causes them to not be as engaged with the SE as they could be. So a, like a path to growth for INTJs is to also like allow the SE a bit more into their life than they would naturally be invulnerable to. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So 
Thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this panel. It, I was like so like glad to talk to you all. You guys contribute something very unique and very valuable to the community that we're all a part of. I, it was like an on, like it was an honest honor to just hear each of your perspectives, and it just really gave me some depth into the INTJ mind. Um, and like, I'm so grateful too that, you know, Chris and Lindsay, you know, you guys came on too. I'm really starstruck because I watch your videos and they're really good. Uh, I recommend you guys check them out in the links below. I'll have everyone link below, whatever they give me, I'll just put it there. But yeah, they're fantastic YouTubers and they offer a lot of depth and like, they they give really like like truth bombs about the INTJ personality that you won't see in other places of the internet. So if you want like solid INTJ content, go check out Chris and Lindsay. <laughs> Compliments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like Melissa, thanks for you know being a part of my certification process at Personality Hacker, um, and thanks for being such a good like personality professor to me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you taught me a lot about type. And yeah, it, it was also like, you know, Jasper and Michael are like my, like, re, like, they're really cool classmates I have at Personality Hacker. You know, they're really, really cunning and intelligent INTJs too. Like, <laughs> like, they're, they're pro, like, their insights are profound and their FI is, you know, it really resonates with the viewers and me. So it's like, wow, you guys have really strong FI opinions, all of you. And it was quite um, like the air of the room or the air of this internet room got more intense as we were talking about the pet peeves. And I was like, oh, that FI. <laughs> so it was really fun to listen to. But yeah, thank you all, you know, to all you INTJs uh, for existing and just shedding so much truth and light and like, like, you guys just bring so much to your type that, you know, I just infinitely thank you guys for. So thanks for coming out. <laughs> thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks for being on. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>